So if we give money to companies who then invest that in the economy, that then creates jobs and economic stability, because a lot of people were laid off. We started seeing that the jobs report were getting a little bit lower and a little bit lower. We saw that the percentage of unemployed started ticking up ever so slightly because that's what the Fed's goal was. They did not want people to have all the money and all the jobs. They wanted people to lose their jobs so that they could bring down the inflation. Check. All right, now they want people to get their jobs so that we don't fall into a recession. We haven't checked that box off yet, which is why a lot of people believe that the Fed is going to offer another significant rate cut at their next announcement because one rate cut does not give everybody back the jobs that were starting to lose it. Hi, it's Drake Reed to Lucy and Wisdom. Today we discuss the Fed rate cut and what it means to your retirement plan. If you have been investing for your retirement, then you know that something very important happened this past Wednesday on September 18th. Whether you're paying attention or you were expecting it to happen, you felt the ripple effect of it. And what I'm talking about is the Fed announced a rate cut of 50 basis points. When it comes to the Fed, their number one goal is promoting economic growth. It's not, and I know it sometimes doesn't feel good to say, but the number one goal isn't for our retirement funds to grow through all these economic conditions, but that could happen. The number one goal is not for everyone to have a job, but that also could happen as well. Their number one goal is economic growth. And when you look at the Fed, when they first started announcing the rate hikes, we know what the type of environment was we had significant inflation. And if the Fed does not keep inflation under control, the reason that has such a huge impact on economic stability is because ultimately, if you just play it all the way out and the dollar becomes worthless, that makes it hard for us to interact with other countries. It makes us hard to pay for different things, makes it hard for you and I to travel. Everything becomes very expensive. It's, it's almost worthless. If you think back to when Russia first started getting the sanctions from the war with Ukraine, there was one point where everyone was trying to trade the rupees out because they're like, this isn't going to be worth anything. No one's going to accept it. We're not going to trade with us and yada, yada, yada. Now, granted, obviously they were able to stabilize a lot of that. But if you don't get inflation under control, there's nothing to stop it from happening. And what I mean is, is basically inflation is this idea that the prices of everything is going up, right? So if the prices are going up, what are you going to ask for? Well, you're, if you're working, you're going to ask for more money. But then the business that provides the services, their labor is the number one cost. So what are they likely to do? They're, well, they're likely to raise their prices. And so you keep asking for more money and businesses keep raising their prices and it just keeps going until you have an economic breakdown, economic collapse. So the Fed stepped in and said, all right, inflation is already at a 40 year high. We're gonna start steadily increasing rates until we see inflation get back around that two to 3%. And that's where we've been at in this last cycle. Jobs, people have not been hired as much. Inflation hasn't been as high as it's been. So now the Fed has a different concern when it comes to economic stability. Because when they raise the rates, there's a couple of things that happen. And then I'm going to get into how this impacts your investments. When you look at a higher interest rate, there's a couple of things that happen. So if you came from literally the lowest rates that we've seen in a very long time, so 75%, 80% of the country refinanced into these two to 3% interest rates. Well, what happens when the interest rate climbs up to six to 9%? Well, obviously people are not gonna be interested in refinancing their houses, where what used to be a $2,000 a month payment is now a $3,500 a month payment, where you're just not able to get the same amount of house as you used to, or you have to pay a significant amount more because of these new interest rates. So the Fed understands that, all right, well, that's going to stop the housing market, which, yep, that's what happened. Then you start looking at employment. We're trying to slow down the inflation, as we just mentioned, where people were getting raises. So how do you get people to stop being able to ask for raises? How do you take the leverage away from the employee and give it to the employer? Well, when you raise interest rates from a business perspective, what you ultimately are saying now is, just like you weren't interested in buying a house now because these rates are so much higher, I'm not interested in taking out a loan to grow my business anymore because the rates are much higher, the numbers don't work as much. The break-even analysis doesn't match up anymore. So I end up having to make changes to my entire company, which ultimately means I have to start laying people off. And that's what's been happening. As the Fed has been increasing rates, you have seen that hundreds of thousands of people have been laid off. Now, the good news is because everyone is still trying to fill in positions, a lot of these people were able to continue finding jobs because we we're just now filling in these gaps where I used to be able to demand a 15, 20% raise 
for what my old salary was, well, now that I'm laid off, I'm just going to accept any job. And so now it shifts back to the employer where the employer now has the leverage where they're just offering kind of regular wages. And I remember when I first left FSU, it was 2009, just kind of right into that great recession. And I remember interviewing for a credit analyst position at, at some healthcare company. I can't remember it off the top of my head. And they told me that they're going to offer me $26,000. Now, granted, this is someone with a four-year college degree in economics of all things. And I'm sitting here like, this, this can't be true. And the way I looked, the, the man could tell that I was a little puzzled. And so he told me, he was like, hey, it used to be $45,000 in 2007. And we would have to give you a turkey on Thanksgiving, in-office daycare, and all these extra benefits because it was so hard to fill a role in 2007. Well, you fast forward to 2009, and he's like, I just interviewed a PhD for this entry-level position. And he said, so we're able to now offer you 26000 right? Almost half of what they were offering that position two years ago. And so when you start seeing this, you are going to be thinking what I'm thinking. You're going to be like, man, well, I don't know if I want to accept this. So let me go look to see if I can find something else. And I think I ended up finding a position for 32000 and that was with Deutsche Bank, where I worked in their P&L and finance department. And that was like, okay, it is what it is. This is where the market is at. And then inside of the company, the reason people are getting laid off is because I hired you in 2007. And because I hired you in 2007, I was paying you this exorbitant amount of money when now I can hire someone for half of that. And so you fast forward to today, that's the same environment where I'm just going to lay off everybody that I was paying these high salaries to during the high inflation times. And I'm going to hire people now that are going to be at this lower market value in the current environment. And that's kind of where we're at. So I give you that background to set the table. So now when we discuss, all right, what does that mean for my investments, Dre? What do I do now that I know the Fed has cut the rates and there's a possibility that they're going to cut them some more? Because again, the Fed's goal is economic stability. And that can look different depending on the economic climate. So first, let's talk about some of the investments that we may need to consider leaving. And the first ones are, of course, going to be bonds. You remember when we were first going through the Great Recession, where interest rates were literally at 0%, and you could not get more than 1% of return on those safe bond investments. Well, we're not there yet. It was just 50 basis points. But you're going to start noticing that those bonds are starting to go down, that they're not offering 5.5% anymore, 6% anymore that you're going to find a 3.5%. You're going to start finding a 3%. You have to be ready for this because it's going to keep going down until there's the feeling again that, all right, now we're back to high inflation, so then they're going to cut the rates again. The good news is because it is a cycle, we can prepare for it. If this is not one of those things that would go in the unpredictable things. This is not unpredictable. This is what the Fed always does. Now, how well they time those interest rate adjustments, that is where the unpredictable comes in. But the idea that the Fed is going to continue lowering rates until inflation starts creeping up, that is the recipe. That's what they always do. So for you with the bonds, that means your bonds are going to keep going down. So you should already start putting a plan in place on how maybe I can start moving some of these bonds from my positions. Now, with that said, for those of you that were able to lock in these bond rates at 5 6 7%, well, that makes your bonds that much more valuable because they're looking in the market and now they're seeing 3%. And you're out there with a 6%. So it may not make sense for you to sell that. But if you did have a plan for the bond market, this would be a great opportunity for you to enact your plan. Because everybody's sitting there trying to find these safe investments. Because as we get closer to retirement, we're not very interested in taking on heavy risk. So as a result, you're looking at bonds and you're, you're getting 4 or 3% right now. And that's still great. But if someone's out there getting 6%, how much do I have to offer them to get that action? And so you have now a commodity that more people are interested in. Now, if you don't have any better alternatives, people ask me all the time, Dre, when should I sell my investment? And I always tell people, when you have a better place to invest your money, if you're getting 5 10%, then you stay there unless you find something that gets you 11 to 15%. And I'm not saying that from the speculative standpoint where we're literally gambling in the stock market. I mean, literally, like you found a solid investment that is performing well, and you believe it's going to perform that way for at least the next five years, right? We're in the business of long-term investment strategy. This is your retirement funds. We're not really trying to speculate and day trade. 
We're trying to find winners that we believe will win for at least five years. So if you're able to find these new opportunities, sure, of course, sell it. If you have an opportunity right now at 5% and you found one at 8%, well, then yeah, that would be the time to sell. In addition to bonds, other relatively safe investments like short-term CDs and money market accounts, those also have that same negative effect where you're going to go from getting 4 to 6% to getting 2 to 3% where you're starting to see that number go down. And the reason that you see banks often lower the returns they give you on your savings account and your money market accounts and your CDs is because, remember, as we just mentioned, as the interest rates go down, the loans that they give on houses, those interest rates also go down. So the bank is receiving less. Now, I know, right, cry me a river. I, I get what you're thinking. But we're just simply saying that that's what it is. The bank is going to give out lower interest rates. And so in return, they'll give lower interest to the people's money that they're using. And the same will be done with business loans, where if you wanted to get a loan to start a business, maybe it would have been 10, 15, 20 percent. Well, maybe now you can find one under 10 percent. Well, with that being said, then the bank, again, is not interested in giving out 5 to 6% on borrowing your money to give to someone else if that's the same amount of money they make. The bank always makes money. Think of the bank like a casino. They always work the spread in their favor. So with that said, if the rates go down on what they can offer people, then the rates also go down on what they pay people to use their money on the offers. And so then that naturally leads to the question, of, all right, Dre, well, then where do I invest my money? And there's really two benefits that you could definitely think of off the top. And then depending on your, your risk tolerance, you would decide on where it makes the most sense as far as how to allocate your portfolio. Number one is the stock market. I don't know if you saw, but the stock market, I think I can pull it up for you, is up about 90% over the past five days. So what do the people know that invest in the stock market that you and I also should know so that we can invest our money and take these gains as well? And what they know is, if businesses are now able to get these loans for much lower amounts of money, they're going to flip that money for a profit. And the bar is not as high. Remember we talked about that a little earlier with the higher interest rates? My break-even point now is much lower with these lower rates. As a result, a lot of these smaller companies that were kind of struggling as we are teetering with this last recession, they're going to be able to breathe much better now because they had ideas. They had the research and development. They had to cut that department when they were downsizing. Now they can reestablish that department. All these businesses that were laying people off, all these you know tech companies and different inventions and ideas that people are really trying to invest this money in. And so the stock market tends to perform very well whenever the interest rates go down. Now, again, that's not the goal of the Fed. Their goal is economic stability. They're just trying to balance the seesaw. And so then it's up to us to make the sound financial decisions that allow us to take advantage of the Fed's goals where we're working with them. So if we give money to companies who then invest that in the economy that then creates jobs and economic stability because a lot of people were laid off. We started seeing that the jobs report were getting a little bit lower and a little bit lower. We saw that the percentage of unemployed started ticking up ever so slightly because that's what the Fed's goal was. They did not want people to have all the money and all the jobs. They wanted people to lose their jobs so that they could bring down the inflation. Check. All right, now they want people to get their jobs so that we don't fall into a recession. We haven't checked that box off yet, which is why a lot of people believe that the Fed is going to offer another significant rate cut at their next announcement because one rate cut does not give everybody back the jobs that were starting to lose it. It doesn't provide the increase that they're looking for for new house builds and house sales. They know that this is going to be something that they have to work on. Just like when they started increasing the rates, they didn't just do it once. They did it over a period of months, and they're also going to decrease the rates. Same idea. It's not going to be once. It's going to be over a period of months. And then they're going to try to find this balance. And as long as we maintain whatever that balance is, which is generally going to be 2 to 3% inflation, the Fed is okay with whatever it takes to make that happen. That's their goal. And so now we're in that opportunity where we're investing in the stock market. And if you're also investing in real estate, because that's also going to be a very beneficial opportunity where you can either invest in REITs, real estate investment trust in the stock market, which I personally love because it makes you a silent partner to a pretty successful firm, assuming that you choose the right one. And that is a great opportunity where I'm investing with people who have apartment complexes and malls and, and airports, like crazy stuff, where I wouldn't be able to join such a team on my own. But now that I can invest in certain companies, I'm a part of that team. I personally like REITs a lot. Now, other people, they do like to get hands-on where they want to actually invest in the houses. They want to flip the houses and they want to put renters in it and occupy it and things like that. 
that works too, because you're going to see the same benefit to where the interest rates are going to go down. People are going to be willing to sell and refinance their house and people are going to be willing to move again. People just simply weren't going to make that financial decision of moving from a two and a half, three percent interest rate to a nine and a half, 10 percent interest rate. Like that just wasn't going to happen. And so the handful of people who were willing to move that ended up creating the housing bubble that you see where all these housing prices are going up, up, up. Well, now that that's cooled down, you have this opportunity to enter the housing market. And that could be a great opportunity for you. Well, if you have one house and then you work to your second one, I see for a lot of people, if it's just on houses, if you want a hundred thousand dollars, then you probably have to have somewhere between eight to 10 houses, depending on how much the house is worth to you. You can build that into your retirement plan. You can work on that the same way that you would invest in the stock market. That's just not something that I really specialize in, but I can't keep track of the numbers and just simply tell you if we're on goal or off goal and whether or not this house is matching what the benchmarks are, or we could run the analysis. But as far as, you know, choosing the house, walking through it, that would have to be your skill set. But this is a great opportunity for you to reinvest in real estate. And then really when you're looking at all of this, that, that naturally brings, and we started talking about it a little bit at the beginning, the risk of inflation coming back. Because as the Fed lowers the rate, as people start getting more jobs again, as people start getting more money, buying more houses, investing more in the stock market, their money's growing and every, everything's going peaches and cream, well, you're going to be back in that same cycle. We're going to peak and then inflation is going to sneak back in and then the Fed's going to start increasing the rates again. And then we can have the strategy where we shift back where everything switches. Now it doesn't make sense to invest in small companies. You normally want to invest in large companies because they weather inflation pretty well. They already have the market share. And so they're able to hold a lot of their prices from the smaller vendors so they can keep maintaining their same profit margins. Small mom and pop shops who don't have the leverage, they're not able to hold those prices. They normally have to pass it on to their customers or they have to eat it and it lowers their margins, which is why a lot of small mom and pops lose money or go completely out of business in these times where we have high interest rates. So ultimately, when you're answering the question, how does the Fed rate cut impact my retirement investments? The investor in the stock market, it's gonna impact them generally positive. We've already seen that. We've seen about a 90% increase in the past five days in the S&P 500. If you're investing in real estate, then again, that's gonna impact you positively. You may have seen the market was starting to dry up. Things were a little bit difficult for you. Those opportunities are going to open up again and those investments are gonna start flourishing as well. Now, if you're invested in bonds and savings account and CDs and mutual funds, then you're going to see that your next set of investments, when you're reinvesting in your CDs, when you're reinvesting in your money market accounts in a year or two years from now, you're going to see that that interest rate is not going to be what it was the last time that you accepted their offer. It may be cut in half by that time. That is something that's going to lower the income that you're going to receive in retirement. And it's something that we want to make sure, generally speaking, that all of our investments are at least keeping up with inflation. Now, it is something where we can have our average portfolio's performance to where we have some great performers and then we can keep the safe money because we're in retirement and, and our risk tolerance doesn't allow us to really go into the stocks and, and explore all these other opportunities. But we do have to have a strategy in place that allows us to offset the lower returns that we're going to see in our bonds and our money market accounts and our CDs and even in your just general savings account. You're going to start seeing those numbers are going to start trickling down again where they're not going to be offering that 5 to 6%. It's going to start getting in that two to three percent range it's going to happen relatively quickly as always i'm thankful for our time together if you found value in this video i simply ask for you to like and subscribe to continue receiving valuable insights and to create your own wealthy retirement system until next time stay safe and enjoy life